Let's look at some more avant-garde photography. So next we're going to look at Maholi Naj and his uh, photographic work from the Bauhaus in Germany. So Laszlo Maholi Naj was of Hungarian descent, spent a good part of his career in Germany, eventually emigrated to the United States. So what we're looking at here is um, it's it's sometimes um, categorized as new vision photography, or they had another name for it in German, but think of it as just the photography from the Bauhaus. This is machine vision photography is another way of, 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 of naming it what he's doing here. He's photographing downwards from the top or as high as he can get in the radio tower in Berlin. So this is a very high tower. It's something like 450 feet tall. So it's taller than the Eiffel Tower. And in Molinage's time, it's an incredible achievement in mechanical building. So he's going up as high as he can get. And instead of just photographing outwards, he's looking straight down. There's no horizon line here so it doesn't look like a landscape photograph. The sort of logic of the photograph, what makes the photograph make sense, is a completely different approach to composition than what was traditionally dominant in photography. It's not landscape, it's not portraiture, it's not still life. It is primarily composed of these kinds of abstract forms. And the kinds of beauty that he sees in this view that he puts into this photograph are all about geometry and mechanization and modern life. So this is in 1928, and this is a very, uh, very energetic and radical way of approaching photography in his time. Now what made this possible for Maholinaj was this camera right here. So this was the first 35 millimeter film camera. So this was a very small camera and the 35 millimeter format came to be the dominant way of taking pictures in the second half of the 20th century. And it began uh, in here in the 1920s. You can still buy 35 millimeter film today. It's still, you know, if you're, if you're shooting with film, it's the cheapest way to go about it. But when they were, um, when they, when these cameras first came out, they were expensive when they came out, they got cheaper later, but because it was so small, small and because you could control so much of what you could do with the camera because you could focus it and you could control the exposure and you could handle it in your hands and take it around with you point it anywhere you want to capture any kind of movement in front of you this radically opened up possibilities for what photography could do so Maholinaj is climbing up to the top of this tower and he's pointing this camera in every possible direction and capturing the view of the world that this little piece of technology makes possible. So that machine aesthetic, that different way of seeing the world that's made possible by this new technology, Maholinaj pushes it further and further with his career in photography. This is another view from the radio tower. He made several different views just sort of looking out from different parts of the tower. Uh, this sort of photography shooting downwards from a high point had already been done. People were doing it when, as soon as it was possible to do, but it was, uh, but with the advent of the Leica camera, it's possible to do uh, with greater sharpness and with more flexibility for, uh, in terms of what's possible. On the left, you see one of Maholinaj's photographs of uh, Bauhaus balconies. Okay, the Bauhaus was a school, an actual school where people could get their degrees, and uh, and the, one of the buildings that they were most famous for in their in the the brief span of the time that uh, that the Bauhaus was an active school um, is the building you see on the right. So two different buildings here, but both of them are architecturally different from any kind of uh, traditional academy that uh, that they would have respected in Germany in the in the generation prior and up to this time it's really a radical thing for the Bauhaus to create an institution of higher education that is all about modernity and all about trying to prepare people to um, to design and build the modern world
So the Bauhaus was a school in Germany that ran from 1919 to 1933 in various forms and sizes during that, that, that span of its lifetime. It was a school for design. It was envisioned to bring the best of modern production to common people. So not just to make design modern, but to make it affordable and mass producible. It ran on an innovative educational structure. The, uh, the, there were different divisions within the school. Once you had completed your sort of basic foundations, you could move on to learn architecture, furniture design, ceramics, metalworking. Color theory and graphic design um, played important roles in the foundation um, division. Typography was absolutely um, highly prized in the um, in the Bauhaus. Textiles, theater, photography, they all played very important roles um, in learning at the Bauhaus. And the people in the different dis divisions collaborated with people in other divisions um, in addition to their specializations. So very influential figures taught there. At the time that the, um, that, the, that the Bauhaus was shut down, the remaining faculty had to disperse. Many of them flee Germany for the United States. So the kinds of uh, furniture and everyday objects that were designed at the Bauhaus, while they were radical in their origins because they were being made from mass producible mechanical parts and put together in ways that were strange and alienating and surprising to people, they became very influential on what modern design would become in the post-war years. And now these original Bauhaus products happen to be tremendously valuable as, a, as design objects, but the imitations that came from them became the mass-produced furniture that we now sort of uh, are surrounded with it, uh, it, from places like Ikea and Target. Graphic design and typography were tremendously important in the Bauhaus. Uh, they were using new means of, uh, of, of doing paste up and printing uh, that allowed them to combine graphics and typography in, in ways that hadn't been possible before. And they designed new typefaces that, uh, that again influenced strongly the, um, the direction of graphic design in the years that followed. The textile division was one area of the Bauhaus where women really dominated. They brought together the kinds of approaches to composition and color that were so strong in other divisions of the Bauhaus and, uh, and, and integrated them with, uh, with industrial means of production that would ultimately make them affordable. Painting was important in the Bauhaus. That was mostly important in their foundation year when they were learning approaches to color theory and composition that could be um, in integrated with their uh, with their designs in other fields. But Vasily Kandinsky was a, a painter who was particularly important in the, in color theory and painting there. So back to Maholinaj, he used the tools of photo montage and graphic design with his work at this time. Here in this piece called Jealousy, you can see he's put it together in a way that sort of tells a story. Um, the, there's the little figure up on the left that's sort of shooting an arrow through the heart of a, of a, a shadow figure next to the woman on the right. So that's photo montage. He also made photograms like the one that you see here um, using strategies of composition and design that were, um, that were prized in the different areas of the Bauhaus. So when you think of the photogram as a photograph, it's not too big a stretch to think that photography can go beyond the casting of a shadow on a piece of paper and out into casting shadows into space. And that's what brings us to the light space modulator. This is a sculpture that he made, but it wasn't designed to be seen as a sculpture so much as it was to project light out into the room around it. So this thing that you see here that looks like a giant batch of cheese graters and gears and things is intended to, um, when it's running, to have light be projecting through it that, uh, that reflects and is dispersed and shadows cast onto the walls and the ceiling all throughout the building that, that it's in. So it's a light space modulator and that's what 
photography does. It modulates light and space. So he's really thinking very big in terms of what photography is and, uh, and how far it can go. Well, eventually the Bauhaus had to be shut down. When the Nazis came to power, they thought that it was, uh, was too radical and it reflected what they considered a Bolshevik influence and that it was too international. So the, uh, the Nazis shut the Bauhaus down. Uh, this, is, this happens to be a student project um, in 1932 because uh, they're, they're sort of watching the Nazis rise to power and they, um, they know their time there is very limited. So many of the Bauhaus faculty um, managed to survive the war and came, some of them, including including Mahalia Nash, came to the United States and uh, established schools here. Mahalia Nash settled in, uh, in, in, um, in Chicago. They established a new design school in Chicago. And the design ideas and design thinking that had risen in Germany during this time become a very, very strong influence on design thinking in the rest of the 20th century.